<laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And we may have some more people drift in. Is there anybody else who needs one of the maps from last week? Anybody? I still have a couple extras. Because we're going to get into a lot of these city names tonight, so you can't tell the players without a program. So if you don't have one, let me give you one. If everybody has one, that's good too. So by way, by way of review, last week, or two weeks ago, I should say, two weeks ago we started the book of Joshua, uh, and we went through the first five chapters. And Joshua, we talked about, is the story of Joshua leading the people of Israel now into the promised land of Canaan to capture it. In the first five chapters we read, we read about the beginning of that. We had the review of Joshua taking over for Moses after Moses' death. We read about him organizing the people. We read about them miraculously crossing the Jordan River on dry ground and when we left them they were camped at Gilgal which if you look on the map is right next to right next to Jericho and remember that throughout Deuteronomy when they were camped on the other side of the Jordan getting ready we kept reading that they were on the plains of Moab across from Jericho So Jericho is going to be is going to be the first major in, engagement, the first major battle. And so now that they're on this side of the Jordan River, they're camped they're camped nearby. And right when we left off last time, uh, Joshua was paid a visit by the commander of the Lord's armies. We also, as we saw, is referred to as the Lord Himself. It was appeared who's appeared to Joshua with a message for him. And so that's where we're picking up in chapter 6. We're picking up the beginning of chapter 6 with Joshua and the Lord speaking here at Gilgal as they prepare as they prepare for Jericho. So chapter 6 verse 1, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. So Jericho is aware that the Israelites are camped right there and are preparing to attack them. So they've sealed up all the gates. They're not letting in caravans and traders in and out. They're on watch, getting ready to defend themselves. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. So these are some non-standard battle tactics. (laughs) Okay? This is not how you would normally attack a walled city. The way you would normally attack a walled city at this point in the Bronze Age... Okay, a walled city that was sealed up like this was you would lay siege to it. Meaning you would camp all around it. You would go and try and find their water sources where they were getting water into the city and either shut them off or poison them or taint them so that they wouldn't have water. And then eventually as their supplies of fresh water and food began to run out, the city would have to surrender. Okay, that's the normal way that you would attack a wall defended city like this. But that's not what the Lord tells Joshua to do. He tells him, I want you to get up every morning this week, get seven priests with, these, are, these uh, trumpets are called shofar. You may have seen them. They're still used for some Orthodox Jewish rituals. They're blown on, on holy days. And it's literally a ram's horn that's been hollowed out and that's blown through. So he says, get seven priests with these horns, 
put them in front, have everybody march around the city once a day, every morning. And then on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, keep in mind the Sabbath day on which you normally do nothing. Okay. On the Sabbath day, go around seven times, blow the horns, everybody yell, and the walls will collapse. Okay? Well, what's, the, what's the significance of telling them to do this? Well, remember I just noted the Sabbath day is the day when they would normally do nothing. And the point here is they're still going to do nothing. Okay? They're not going to capture Jericho because of some cleverly thought out strategy they have or because they outnumber them. They're going to capture Jericho because God's going to give it to them. He's going to give it to them. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people advance, march around the city, with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the people, Do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the people returned to camp and spent the night there. Now you may imagine the confusion if you were someone living in Jericho <laughs> at this time. Because every morning, these people go and march once around the city blowing horns, and they don't do anything else, right? and then go make camp. This happens for six days. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring disaster on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. So remember, because Rahab had hidden the spies they sent, they had told her that when this was happening to get her whole family into her home, which was inside the city walls, remember, and to have a scarlet cord hanging from the, the window to identify that that was her home, and then she and her family, she and her family would be spared. So verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Okay. Now, I recently saw a History Channel documentary <laughs> about this story in which they spent a great deal of time theorizing that if with the yelling and the horns you hit exactly the right frequency. <laughs> you, could, you, could, you could make the walls clap. Which to me seems to be begging the question because for Joshua in the Bronze Age to have that level of knowledge of acoustic physics <laughs> to be able to figure out the exact tonality and volume he needed to knock down a wall would be miraculous in itself. But God knows everything. Right. So, so if that is how it happened, then God told him how to do it. <laughs> And it's still, it's still just as miraculous. So I don't know the point of going into that whole, that whole detailed explanation. The other thing to note is, remember, Rahab's house was in the wall. 
That's how the spies escaped, remember? They were lowered down her window. Which means, since her whole family was in her home, when we're told the walls collapse, that part at least must have still been standing. That, that part of the wall. <laughs> so, again, if this, if this was some great feat of, of acoustic physics, it's really impressive because he was able to aim it perfectly. <laughs> to not destroy that one that one piece of the wall. I think it's a question of people. <laughs> the idea that God doesn't work miracles, he just empowers people. Yeah. And then stands in the background. Possibly. Well, the point is verse 19, 18 and 19. Just keep yourselves from the accursed thing. This right. Is that referring to the silver and gold? Also? That's, well, this is going to go back. We, we talked about back in, at the end of Leviticus and again at the beginning of Numbers, we talked about this idea of what the old King James Version translated as the ban. Things that were put under the ban. And the uh, we talked, the, the Aramaic word is harem, not to be confused with harem. Harem is having a whole bunch of wives <laughs> in one place. This is harem which <laughs> and not, not haram, <laughs> which is what people say to me all the time. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the, idea, the idea of, uh, and, and it was translated into Greek as anathema. The idea is that these things are under God's curse. They're under God's curse. And so the idea here is because God has uh, God's curse, where we talk about the blessings and curses at the end of Deuteronomy, the Canaanites have done all of this evil. And they've piled up all this iniquity. And so God has now said, look, the cup of their iniquity is full. Now they're getting wiped out. Okay. And so his intent is that Israel wipes the city of Jericho off the face of the earth. So it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And that means everything there has been placed under the ban or is anathema or is under God's curse. So what he's saying is you don't get to sort of loot and pillage. Right? You don't get to, whether it be a woman who catches your eye or whether it be uh, wealth, gold, silver, any of these things, you don't get to take any of it. It's all... It's all under the curse. Leave it be. So that's, that's what that's talking about. God's saying, don't, you're not to take any of this stuff for yourselves. Okay. So remember, we talked about how at, in Deuteronomy, remember there are those rules for warfare. When the Israelites went to war, that they were supposed to go out, they were supposed to ask for peace, they were supposed to attempt to negotiate peace, that if they couldn't negotiate peace, they had to go to war. They were only to kill the, the adult fighting men of the city. They were not to attack the women and children. Right? So those were the rules for warfare. This is a whole different set. This is a whole different set of rules because they're acting as God's agent to destroy this city. Okay. And so what we're seeing here, what God is making plain to them with the walls falling in this way is it's God who's destroying the city. Not them. And so because it's God destroying the city, this plunder is God's not theirs. So they're not they're not to take it. You know, you know that history channel also had that with that rope hanging out the window. Yeah. And them constantly marching around and the people were watching them were watching that. And so oh, yeah. the agents got in there. The first special forces in the world. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was that was part of the theory too. Was that the the scarlet cord wasn't just a marker, right? The people marching around the city were a distraction, while Israelite SEAL Team Six went up the rope, <laughs> through the wall, and went in and. You know. Actually, I think the scarlet cord was George's So, so yeah, there there are a number of. Interesting theory. 
But I think the idea behind the story that we read here is, is pretty clear. This idea that God wants to make sure the Israelites know it's him <laughs> destroying the city, not them. Verse 22, Joshua, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest will he set up its gates. So the Lord is with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. There's a note in the Septuagint. There's a note in the Septuagint that, because of course it was translated later, that exactly that happened to the man who did rebuild Jericho that his oldest son died when he started building. All his other sons died, and his youngest son died at the time he finished. That's what the study Bible. Yeah, because that's they're translated from the Septuagint. So that that, that that prophecy came true. So, now there, there's a question we might have here about Rahab. Because remember, over and over and over and over and over again, in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, here at the beginning of Joshua, God has said, when you go into these Canaanite cities, you kill everyone and everything. Right? Men, women, children, donkeys, cows, chickens. Right? Level the place. Destroy everything. Okay? Yet they've spared Rahab and her family. Okay. They've spared Rahab and her family. So what does this tell you? What does this tell us? Okay, and nowhere are they condemned for sparing Rahab's family. Quite the, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. We're gonna see, we're gonna see in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus that Rahab is. Jesus, great, 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 grandmother. Probably a couple more grades. Okay. So she's in the line that leads to Jesus. Okay. Now, we know for sure that this is not because Rahab is more virtuous than the other people living in Jericho. Right? Because she's a prostitute. So it's not like she's been leading an exemplary righteous life here in the city of Jericho. Okay? And so she's a, she's a foreigner. She's a Canaanite. She's one of the people they're supposed to kill. She's apparently been doing the stuff that God's condemning them for because she's a prostitute. She's a harlot. Okay? Well, if you remember what happened was when those two spies came to her, she said, I've heard about what Yahweh your God did in Egypt. I've heard about the things that have happened leading up to this day, how you defeated those kings. And I've heard how he's going to give you this land. Right? Meaning she, unlike a whole lot of people we've read about in the last few books, actually believes that God is going to keep all these promises he's been making. Okay, so she expresses faith. She expresses faith. That's the thing that sets her apart from every other from every other person in Jericho. Okay. But now, so now we can look and we can say, okay, well, Rahab's faith saved her, right? Everyone else in Jericho, dead, wiped out, wiped off the face of the earth except her because of her faith. Okay. And that's true. But now we have to ask a second question. And that's, what comes after this? 
That's what comes after this. She had faith, so she saved from the destruction of Jericho. But then she goes, and she becomes an Israelite. Okay. Do you think she continued to be a prostitute? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you think she continued to live as a Canaanite and practice Canaanite worship? No. <laughs> so her faith that saves her also produces a life of repentance. Right? She turns around, she changes the direction of her life. Right? She changes the way she's living her life. It produces a life of, of worship of Yahweh. <laughs> she, becomes a, she becomes an Israelite. Okay? She becomes part of she becomes part of the community that God has made a covenant with. Okay? Now this seems pretty simple and straightforward and kind of obvious, right? Okay? But believe it or not, if I went in <laughs> to a lot of churches that call themselves Christian and I said what I just said right now, it would be unbelievably controversial. <laughs> okay, the, the idea that I get this. We can see in the case of Rahab, faith saves us and then produces a life of repentance, a life of worship of the true God, and that, that we live out that life as a member of, in our case, the church. Right? That, that, is, that is unbelievably controversial. But, it, but it's, it's here, and, and, and I want to lay it out here because in a couple of years... <laughs> when we're in the New Testament and we get to St. Paul's epistles, okay, St. Paul starts laying this same thing out in all kinds of theological terms that we can get ourselves all in a mess arguing about the definition of, of justification and sanctification and glorification and, and all kinds of other Latin words and miss out on the fact that all he's trying to do is talk about this pattern that we're going to see through the whole Old Testament. Okay. We're going to see through the whole the whole Old Testament. We saw this with Abraham, we saw this but but Rahab here is a really striking example. So I wanted to I wanted to lay this out here. And and again, it, it it's not that it doesn't have to be that complicated. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. She, be, she, believes, she believes in the Lord. She believes in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so she becomes an Israelite. She changes the way she lives her life. <laughs> and she follows him as part of that community. Um, another thing is that her faith proceeds into action immediately. When she shelters them and helps right. them get out, that is itself an act of faith. Right. She chooses, she chooses their side yes. against her own people. Because the, the, from the perspective of the people of Jericho, she's a traitor, right? She sold out her people. You know, Father, this big thought hit my mind that, okay, in the extreme, in the extreme of that warped sense of understanding of Christianity, that if faith saves her, then if faith alone, period. Right. Then she could have, after being saved, she could continue to prostitute, Canaanite, and all those other things. And all her actions would have, no, no it's okay. She, she's right. now saved. Right. Once she's saved, she can do anything you want to do. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. exactly. Exactly, and that's it. That's, that's and, and you could come and call, call repentance and worship and being part of the community, you could call that works if you want to. <laughs> But it, it seems to me that this is just, I, mean, I think if we took the average kid in Sunday school and said, when you, when, when you become a Christian, do you need to repent of your sins? Yeah. Do you need to come to church and worship God? Yeah. Do you need to be part of the church? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not until we complicate it. Not rocket science. Yeah, until we complicate it by trying to turn it into theology and turn it into. Um, 
when I was a born again, they sort of got around that by saying that if you didn't repent, then you didn't give the price to begin with, and therefore you never were saved. <laughs> right, which is which is certain. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So chapter chapter seven verse one. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Those things under the ban that we were talking about. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. So Achan, this one man, while they were going through and ransacking Jericho, saw some stuff that caught his eye, decided to keep it for himself. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel. If you look on the map, we haven't, we haven't identified archaeologically where Ai was, so the, that's why there's a question mark there. But the location here on the map is based on the description I just read <laughs> of where it was. Okay. So Jericho has fallen. Joshua sends men to scout the next city. The next city on the list, Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. So they go up, they say, This is, this is fairly lightly defended. We don't need to uproot everybody from the camp and all go attack. Put together, a, put together a squad, send them in to take it, and return. So about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Okay, so Ai, like most cities in this part of the world, particularly in the Bronze Age, is built on what's called a tell, which is sort of a very small plateau. Okay. So they would put the walls at the edge. So the idea being, if they seal up the gates and the wall is closed, anybody who's going to lay siege or attack is going to have to go up this slope, which is going to put them in a field of fire for arrows, for rocks, for anything else they want to throw down on them. And it's going to let you see anybody coming from a fair ways off. So when it says they killed them on this, chased them back down the slopes, that's what this is talking about. Okay. That they came up to try and, and attack. Not only was the attack beaten back, but the, the troops from Ai actually came out of the city and chased them. <laughs> chased them back away and killed more while they were fleeing. Okay. The hearts of the people melted and became like water. So now all of a sudden they're like, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> right? We were, this, was, this was all supposed to be like Jericho, right? This was supposed to be easy. We weren't supposed to have to do anything. You know, now why, why are we retreating? Why are people getting killed? Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. So this is, we're going to see this as we go through the Old Testament. This is a common expression of, of grief and of grieving is to, is to rip your, your clothing, to put dust and, or ashes on your head and to sort of sit on the ground or lay on the ground. Okay. So Joshua and all of the other elders of the people do this in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And apparently lay there for some period of time, because it says until evening. So for hours they're there mourning what's happened. Okay, because, you know, again, Joshua has received all the teaching from Moses that we just got. So he must know at this point that there was something, something someone did that now they're not on God's side anymore. Right? There's, there's some reason why God didn't give them this city. Joshua said, Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? 
If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? So Joshua tries a a ploy that Moses has used before. (laughs) He says, you know, we we had a pretty good thing going. Everybody was kind of scared of us coming into this. Now they're going to hear about how we got beat back at AI. You know, they're all going to get together and they're going to come and kill us. And God, that's going to make you look bad. (laughs) Because if we come in here and we get killed now, you know, that's going to make it look like... uh, you weren't helping us. So verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up, what are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned, they have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Okay, so the idea is if you take any of these things that are under God's curse for yourself, that puts you under the same curse they're under. So if you want and you keep and you take these, these things of the Canaanites, God's reckoning you as a Canaanite. So we saw Rahab, you know, was a Canaanite who decided to switch teams. What it's essentially saying is that Achan is an Israelite who's decided to switch teams. Okay, who's decided that that this stuff he's got is pretty good. This idea is similar to what we saw way back in Genesis in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I remember Lot was really the only the only righteous person in Sodom. And so just in the same way that that we saw God now save Rahab, he got Lot out of there before the city was destroyed because he doesn't punish the the righteous with the wicked. Remember, he told Lot and his family, when you leave, don't look back. Don't look back. Okay, And famously, Lot's wife did look back and became a pillar of salt. Okay. She looked back at what was, what was being destroyed. Okay. The idea is similar here. The idea is similar here. These things are under the curse. These things are under the curse. God's saying, don't have anything to do with them. Achan's deciding he kind of wants them more. And this is a theme that's going to carry all the way through all the way through into the New Testament. A notable a notable example being Judas. Right, Judas is one of the disciples, one of Christ's closest followers. Right? But he looks at 30 pieces of silver and he decides I kind of want that more. Right? And remember afterwards, when he feels bad about it, he tries to return the silver to go into the temple treasury. And what do the Pharisees tell him? Blood money. It's blood money. We can't. We want nothing to do with it. Right? We want nothing to do with it. So the, this theme is talking about, it's talking about, and we've seen this saw this with Sodom and Gomorrah, we saw it a little bit with Noah and the flood, and we're seeing it here again now. This idea that the world, after the curse in Genesis, that's under God's curse, is being destroyed. Not all at once, because God's being patient. He's allowing each of these peoples, and each of these cities, and each of these groups, he's allowing, he's bearing with a lot of wickedness. But eventually it reaches a point where his judgment falls on. And he's repeatedly telling his people, you have nothing, have nothing to do with this world that's being judged. Okay. Have, nothing, have nothing to do with it. And we're going to see this theme a lot in the New Testament. Come out and touch no unclean thing. 
You know, this idea that the world is perishing. And if we try to cling to it, if we try to keep these things from this world that are perishing, if they are so valuable to us, then we end up perishing with it. We end up dying with it. Okay? And so this is, this is the decision that Achan has now made. Achan has now made the decision to switch teams. He's decided he kind of likes the things of the Canaanites. He kind of likes them and he'd like to have those for himself rather than what God has promised to him and his fellow Israelites at the end. So in verse 13, go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. That which is devoted is among you, O Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come forward man by man. He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Okay. Now you notice he's going to be destroyed by fire. Right? That's not the normal way the death penalty was talked about in the Pentateuch that we just read. People were stoned to death. Right? But remember what, what happened to Jericho. They burned it. They burned it. Okay. So again... If you want these things from Jericho, and what happened to Jericho is going to happen to you if you're, choosing, if you're choosing Jericho. Keep in mind also how much time has passed here. Okay, Achan took these things and is sitting on them. They attacked Ai, <laughs> right? They were defeated. Joshua sat before the Lord. Now he's saying, tomorrow morning, right? These devoted things must be destroyed. Okay, so Achan hasn't, has yet to step up, <laughs> right? He hasn't said, it was me. He hasn't gone and destroyed the stuff. He hasn't done anything. Okay, now he's told tomorrow morning, God's going to show us who did it. And still, he isn't saying anything. He isn't doing anything. So in verse 16, early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was taken. The clans of Judah came forward, and he took the Zerites. He had the clan of the Zerites come forward by families, and Zimri was taken. Okay, so now, again, they're, they're narrowing in on Achan. Does Achan say anything? Does Achan do anything? No. Joshua had his family, the family of Zimri, come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Okay, so now he's found out. So apparently, apparently he didn't even believe Joshua that God was going to point out that it was him. <laughs> okay. And Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the, robe, in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, that's about five pounds of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, which is about one and a quarter pounds of gold, I coveted them and took them, they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Okay, so finally he's on the spot and has no place to hide. He says, yeah, this is what I took. And this is where it's hidden. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. And there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this disaster on us? The Lord will bring disaster on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. 
Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore the place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. Achor means disaster. <laughs> it means disaster. Okay. So why did he confess? Well, because he was he was pretty much on the spot. I mean, God had identified him as the one who did it, and he had to know that if if they got, if he lied and they sent people to search his tent, they would have found they would have found the things. Okay. Now, when the church fathers comment on this passage, in addition to what I already talked about. They talk about how there, there's a, a, an allegory or a metaphor going on here about our own lives. About our own lives. Okay. And that is, if there's any part of us or any small thing that's still clinging to something, still clinging to some sin or something of this world, then that, that, even if it's a quote-unquote small thing, in and of itself will be enough to bring us to destruction. Okay. Just as this one man doing this caused the whole, the whole army to fail. So if there's something in our life that we've decided, I don't really need to repent of that, or I don't really want to repent of that, or I kind of like doing that, or I don't think it's really a sin, or I don't think it's really that serious, that will be enough to destroy us. That will be enough. That small thing, whatever it is, will be enough to eventually destroy our life, destroy our salvation. Okay. And so the church fathers say we need to be ruthless in hunting those things down. And hunting those things down when we repent. Of finding those things. And repenting of them. Finding them and getting rid of them. Okay. A lot of times we take the approach to repentance of, you know, well, is there something bothering me right now? You know, which is the approach that me and a lot of people my age take to going to the doctor. We don't go to the doctor unless, you know, there's actual pain. <laughs> going on somewhere in our body. Right. Well, the point is, if I wait until I'm actually feeling pain to go to a doctor, that could kill me. That could kill me, because there could be things going on in my body that I know nothing about, and by the time I feel something, by the time they bother me, they could have progressed to the point where they will kill me. And the, same, the same is true spiritually. Same is true spiritually. We have sins in our lives that don't really bother us, that aren't really, you know, it's not affecting my marriage, it's not affecting my family, it's, you know, I've got it over on the side, in the corner. It's not bothering me. I feel okay about things. I've got nothing to repent of. And by the time it bothers us, by the time it bothers us, it's done real damage. By the time it bothers us or inconveniences us or causes a problem in our life, something's already been destroyed. Okay. And so we need, to be, we need to be proactive about repenting. We need not just wait until we realize, oh yeah, that, that I did was kind of crummy. Or until someone confronts us and says, you know, what, <laughs> look at what you've been doing and look at all the damage you've caused. Not wait for that. But look at ourselves and scrutinize ourselves and try to find those things before, before they go so far that they do damage. Does that make sense? Okay. So chapter 8, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. Okay. So now, 
Another interesting thing to note is, you remember before the last attack on Ai, Joshua didn't have any conversation with God about it. He sent some spies, the spy says, ah, this one looks easy. So Joshua sent in troops. Right? Now, he's, now he's talking to God. <laughs> and God says, God says to him, take the whole army. Take the whole army. He says, and go up there, do as I tell you to do, and I will give you the city. Okay. And what he tells them to do is set an ambush behind the city. So if this is if this is the city viewed from above, okay. This part at the front is the gate. And that's the that circle represents the hill. The hill that it's on. Okay. God is telling Joshua to send a group of troops back here. Back here. Okay. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You are to set an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. All of you be on alert. I and all those with me will advance on the city. And when the men come out against us as they did before, we will flee from them. They will pursue us until we have lured them away from the city. For they will say they are running away from us as they did before. So when we flee from them, you are to rise up from ambush and take the city. The Lord your God will give it into your hand. When you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded. See to it, you have my orders. Okay. So the night before, these 30,000 men come and position themselves back here behind, behind the hill that the city's on. And what Joshua is saying is Joshua is going to lead the main force up to the gate like he's attacking the city. Okay. Once they start with the arrows and the rocks and the defensive attacks, they're going to do what happened last time. They're going to turn around and retreat back the way they came, hoping that just like last time, the men defending the city will chase them out of the city. And once they've chased the Israelites out of the city, these guys can come around, come in through the gate and take the city. So this, time they did a commando. this is yes. This is a commando team, but this is this is the strategy. Okay. Once again, special forces. Special forces, right? <laughs> Thirty thousand of them. <laughs> okay. That Joshua sent them off, and they went to the place of ambush and lay in wait between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night with the people. Early the next morning, Joshua mustered his men, and he and the leaders of Israel marched before them to Ai. The entire force that was with them marched up and approached the city and arrived in front of it. They set up camp north of Ai with a valley between them and the city. Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So he's also got an even smaller team over here as a second ambush. They had the soldiers take up their positions, all those in the camp to the north of the city and the ambush to the west of it. That night Joshua went into the valley. When the king of Ai saw this, he and all the men of the city hurried out early in the morning to meet Israel in battle at a certain place overlooking the Arabah. But he did not know that an ambush had, be set, had been set against him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel let themselves be driven back before them, and they fled toward the desert. All the men of Ai were called to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were lured away from the city. Not a man remained in Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel. They left the city open and went in pursuit of Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out toward Ai the javelin that is in your hand, for into your hand I will deliver the city. So Joshua held out his javelin toward Ai. As soon as he did this, the men in the ambush rose quickly from their position and rushed forward. They entered the city and captured it and quickly set it on fire. Okay, so the plan goes off without a hitch. <laughs> okay. The ambush enters, sets the city on fire. Well, the men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising against the sky, but they had no chance to escape in any direction, for the Israelites who had been fleeing toward the desert had turned back against their pursuers. So once the city's on fire, these people they've been chasing turn around to face them, 
and the men who had ambushed and set the city on fire come from this side. So all the men of Ai are outside the city with the Israelites in front of them and behind them. And they're trapped, and there's no place for them to escape. Question. If the troops are behind the city, and Joshua stretches out his spear, I can see it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't say that they saw it. God tells him to stretch out his javelin toward the city, and we're told that at the same moment that he does that, they attack. They attack. So God is involved. Okay. <laughs> okay. Or maybe the desert is guarded or something. <laughs> you notice the javelin is similar to the stick that Moses used. Right, but this is this is a thing. God's telling him to do it as a symbol. Now that's what I mean. Yeah. Symbolizes Moses. Yeah. Moses used the staff. Joshua uses the right. javelin. At least in this instance, yeah. Okay. So, verse 22, the men of the ambush also came out of the city against them so that they were caught in the middle with Israelites on both sides. Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivors nor fugitives. But they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing all the men of Ai in the fields and in the desert where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those who were in it. Twelve thousand men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all who lived in Ai. So again, this is a this is a symbolism more than a, a, a signal. But Israel did carry off for themselves the livestock and plunder of this city as the Lord had instructed Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins, a desolate place to this day. He hung the king of Ai on a tree and left him there until evening. At sunset, Joshua ordered them to take his body from the tree and throw it down at the entrance of the city gate, and they raised a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. So remember in Deuteronomy, we read, God said, Cursed is anything that hangs on a tree. Okay. So what's done to the king of Ai when he's hung on this, when he's hung on this tree is the ultimate symbol that he is under. He is under God's curse. Okay. And we talk about how that gets reflected, of course, in what happens to Christ. But this image, this image of a human being hanging on a tree, exposed to the elements, exposed to the wild animals, is sort of the ultimate picture of a human being who's been abandoned by everyone, including God, and who is, who is a curse. So we see this picture of the king of Ai who is under, <laughs> under God's curse. We see Christ in the same, in the same position. As St. Paul says that he was without, sin became a curse for us. Okay. Verse 30, Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites, he built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua copied on stones the law of Moses which he had written. All Israel, aliens and citizens alike with their elders, officials, and judges were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing those who carried it, the priests who were Levites. Half of the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had formerly commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the aliens who lived among them. Okay, so they've had... I'm sorry, I'm okay. totally lost as to where you are because it kind of ended and then went into... Except two against numbers are different. Yeah, oh, so the verse. Very okay. <laughs> yeah, let me go. Okay. Nine. Yeah, when it starts. 30, there is no 30. Yeah, that's the beginning of... Yeah, there's a break... 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the chapter the chapter break is in a different place. Yeah, the chapter break is in a different place. The same episode occurs, but the, yeah. the chapter break is in a different place. So that's why. That's the beginning of chapter 9 in the Septuagint. Orthodox yeah. study Bible uses the Septuagint, Greek translation. Yeah, and all and and to further complicate things, all, none of these numbers were actually there until to begin with. <laughs> to begin with, until well into the Middle Ages. So, <laughs> and then things got separated differently. Okay, but that's that. That's the beginning of. That's the beginning of uh, chapter nine in the Septuagint. If you're using the Orthodox Study Bible. So they've just, they've just had this incident where someone broke the covenant and they experienced failure. Right? And that's taken care of. They experience success again. And so Joshua takes this opportunity to repeat what happened, what we saw happen at the end of Deuteronomy. He has the Levites divided into the two groups representing the blessings and the curses. He reads to them Specifically Deuteronomy. In the Septuagint it says specifically the second the second law, Deuteros Nomos, the, the the book of Deuteronomy, that that's what he specifically read to them. Sets it out before them again. Right? With Achan now, their experience with Achan now being an object lesson. Hey look, here's your choice. You can choose blessings, you can choose curses. Okay. Achan chose curses. Rahab chose blessings. <laughs> okay. And he calls on everyone to commit themselves again. Because he we're not wanting a repeat of Achan. Right? We're getting everyone back committed to this is this is what we're doing. This is why we're here. This is what we need to do if we want God to to grant us victory. Okay. Now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, those in the hill country and the western foothills and along the entire coast of the great sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. Okay. So word gets around (laughs) to the kings of all these other cities about what happened with Jericho and Ai. Ai was kind of small, but Jericho was a major walled city. Okay, and so the the kings are starting to talk to each other. We talked about how there weren't really nations; that all these ites we hear about those are ethnic, those are ethnic groups. That each of these cities is really independent and has its own king. Well, now these kings are starting to try and get their act together because they're like, look, <laughs> this is. Look what happened to the king of Ai hanging on that tree. We're next if we don't figure something out here. <laughs> okay, so let's let's start making some treaties. Treaties. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. Okay. So the Gibeonites, Gibeonites are going to be a little more clever. Okay. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, make a treaty with us. Okay. So they go and get dirty clothes, filthy clothes. Right, old wrecked gear. Throw it on their donkeys. They send this delegation, looking shabby, saying, "We came from far away. We want to make a peace treaty with you." Okay. And the men of Israel said to the Hivites, "But perhaps you live near us. How then could we make a treaty with you?" He said, "They're not dumb. They're like, how do we know you're not some of these Canaanites?" <laughs> right. Trying to trick us to get, make a treaty. They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. We have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. 
And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. Right? They say, This was nice fresh bread when we set out from far away. Now look, it's all old and moldy. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are, and our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Okay, so they took a look and said, oh yeah, you, you, they're looking pretty shabby. Yeah, okay. They look like they came a long way. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Okay, so they swore an oath to Yahweh that they wouldn't harm any of these people that they're making a peace treaty with. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So three days later, they find out, wait a second, these guys live right over there. (laughs) So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephra, Birot, and Kiriat Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn on oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. <laughs> okay, so all the people are going to go, we're supposed to wipe these people out, and the idiots go and swear an oath. But all the leaders answered, we have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do to them. We will let them live so that wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community. So the leader's promise to them was kept. That word that's translated there, woodcutters, really means sort of laborers. Okay, It's the same, it's the same word that's actually uh, used of Joseph. St. Joseph the betrothed in the New Testament. Jesus' human father. Then it's usually translated as carpenter, but really means laborer. Okay, so it means sort of a day laborer in our modern. So they'd work with stone, with wood, with whatever. In other words, they actually became what they pretended to be. Yeah, other, well, they're, doing, they're going to do grunt, the grunt work. <laughs> they're going to do the dirty jobs that nobody else wants to do. They answered, Joshua, your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. Okay. So Joshua realized he's been tricked. Where do you get off tricking me? He say, look, man, we saw what you did. <laughs> These other cities, we don't want to get wiped out. Okay. Now notice, now notice, their approach is very different than Rahab's approach. Right? Rahab's approach, she hears these things and says, I want to be part of what the Lord is doing. These guys don't necessarily <laughs> want to be part of what the Lord is doing. They just don't want to die. Right? And so they resort to this trickery. They resort to this trickery to get there. Faith without works. <laughs> no, no faith. This is knowledge without faith. Okay. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites and they did not kill them. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the community and for the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. This is the beginning of things going wrong. Things going wrong. Remember... I've mentioned several times when when God gave the prophecy to them about the piece of land he was going to give them, that it was much bigger than anything they ever actually possessed. This is the beginning of why. Okay. They're first, they've already made a peace treaty and spared this whole group of Canaanites who are staying Canaanites. Right? There's nothing here about them converting worshiping Yahweh, become a part of Israel. They're staying Gibeonites. They're just being used as a cheap labor force. 
Okay. So this is this is the beginning, and we're going to see this is going to continue because we're going to see as we go forward into Judges and as we go forward into the period of the kings of Israel, there's still going to be all these Canaanites and Philistines and all these other people still around, still that they're still constantly having wars with. This is the beginning of that. Okay, because what God told them to do was go in and wipe them out. Now you may say, well, they swore this oath, they got tricked. Well, Joshua just read Deuteronomy to them. And if you remember when we studied Deuteronomy, there was a clause. <laughs> if you make a hasty oath, if you make an oath and you, and you can't keep it, okay? There were sacrifices that you could bring, you could bring to the tabernacle and be released from the oath. But already apparently the leaders of the people these are the elders <laughs> these are the leaders either don't know that <laughs> or aren't <laughs> or, or are willing to do it maybe they want them for the cheap labor force <laughs> right but they're, they're not they're not following it okay the option was there you know they're presenting they present it to Joshua as this catch 22 we made this oath what can we do? Right? But in reality, there is something they could do if they were really motivated to do what God had told them to do. And so this is, this is the beginning of the compromises. We're going to start seeing compromises. Okay. So chapter 10. Now Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem... You can see Jerusalem, not far from Jericho and Ai. So he has a reason to be concerned right at the moment. Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. Okay. Yeah, Gibeon is over here near Bethshean. The Gibeonites were from that area, north of Shechem there. Okay on the map so we read that you know the, 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 the kings were starting to get together to try and plot a counter attack and now he the nearest guy to where the Israelites are right now finds out that one of the major one of his major potential allies has just defected <laughs> right it's just, it's just made a peace treaty with Israel so they're not going to help him okay. they're not going to help him so that's even more cause for concern. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, which is down here, Piram, king of Jarmut, Jaffia, king of Lachish, just right here on the map, and Debir, king of Eglon, which is in that same area. So these are the kings of the area south of him, basically. Well, he's been he's been cut because of the Gibeonites defecting. He's been cut off from the ones to the north. Okay, so he the the group to the south of him says, "Come up and help me attack Gibeon." He said, "Because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites." Okay, so rather than trying to take on the Israelites head on, he decides, "Well, they're now allies with Gibeon. Let's go take out." Let's go take out Gibeon. And the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. Okay. So now, now not only... 
Are the Israelites tolerating the Gibeonites still existing and still continuing to be pagan Canaanites with their worship and their practices and all these things that God is judging them for? Not only are they tolerating them, now they're defending them. <laughs> right? Now they're fighting to protect them. Okay? So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makedah. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. Okay. So even though the Israelites aren't doing what they're supposed to do, God's judgment is still against these people. Right? And you notice... You notice the, the importance of pointing out that these hailstones kill more than the Israelites. Okay, the Israelites are no longer the instrument of what God's doing. God kills them with what? One of the plagues he sent on Egypt. Okay. So is, Israel isn't completely on God's side anymore, but God is still doing what God intends to get done. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nations avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, which of course we don't have. <laughs> but the idea here, remember that the sun and moon were created by God in order for men to judge times and seasons. So the idea here is that the day, essentially time stopped to give enough time for these people to be wiped out. Okay. So that's the image. The, the, don't take it too literally. The idea isn't that this earth stopped revolving <laughs> around the sun and stopped rotating. <laughs> that's not necessarily that specific. The idea is that God made time stand still, essentially. So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makedah. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makedah, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop, pursue your enemies, attack them from the rear, and don't let them reach their cities. For the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua finds out that the kings have all hidden out in this cave complex. Okay. So Osama bin Laden wasn't the first person with that idea. <laughs> you go and hide in these caves. It doesn't work out quite as well for them because Joshua says, go seal the caves. <laughs> right? Go roll rocks in front of seal off the caves and go hunt down their troops. <laughs> right? We'll save them for later. So Joshua and the Israelites destroyed them completely, almost to a man, but the few who were left reached their fortified cities. Okay? So the idea is they're trying to get them and wipe them out before they can hole up. Before they can hole up and defend themselves in the walled cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makedah, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees. They were left hanging on the trees until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. 
Does anybody see a parallel here to something in the New Testament? Right. We have we have these kings are hung on these trees at sunset. They're taken down, put in these caves, caves sealed with a stone. Right. <laughs> huh? No, the kings did not come out three days later, right? But, Jesus is not but here, right here, here, this is this is the picture, right? That these so-called kings are under God's curse. They're sealed away in these caves forever. They're over in Dunwich, right? They're over in Dunwich. So that's the imagery. See this story would be familiar to the people at the time of Jesus' death. Okay, so Christ is hung on the cross with the inscription, King of the Jews, hung over his head to mock him. At sunset, he's taken down, he's put in this cave, the cave is sealed. We're done with him, right? <laughs> and it turns out to be wrong. Surprise, surprise. Okay. <laughs> we turned out to be wrong. And so this, this is the image that, for example... St. Peter in his sermon on, on Pentecost is picking up. He talks to the, the people of Jerusalem and says, this Jesus whom you crucified, whom you killed, God has vindicated as a righteous man by raising him from the dead. Right? You condemned him. You said he was a pretender and not a real king. You cursed him. You put him in a tomb and said he was under But God showed that none of that was the case. All right, that he wasn't a pretender. That he wasn't a cursed. By raising him from the dead. Okay. So this is, this is the image that harkens back to. Okay. This is the image that harkens back to. That day Joshua took Machedah. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors. And he did to the king of Machedah as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Machedah to Libna and attacked it. The Lord also gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it Joshua put to the sword. He left no survivors there. And he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish. He took up positions against it and attacked it. The Lord handed Lachish over to Israel, and Joshua took it on the second day. The city and everyone in it he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. Meanwhile, Horam king of Gezer had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Lachish to Eglon. They took up positions against it and attacked it. They captured it that same day and put it to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it, just as they had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They took the city and put it to the sword together with its king, its villages, and everyone in it. They left no survivors just as at Eglon. They totally destroyed it and everyone in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned around and attacked Deber. They took the city, its king, and its villages and put them to the sword. Everyone in it they totally destroyed. They left no survivors. They did to Deber and its king as they had done to Libna and its king and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, which is the desert, the western foothills and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings in their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Okay, so they've taken this whole southern region, leveled the cities. Okay, that's the southern, the southern campaign. Okay, and ne next week we are going to have a new map that will reflect what it looks like after, <laughs> after these campaigns. Yeah, <laughs> scorched earth. <laughs> Well, this is, I mean, this is taking place for most likely over a period of months because they're moving literally like a couple hundred thousand people. You know, that's awful. They killed as a group. every last soul, even little kids. That's awful. It's barbaric. <laughs> Hideous. Killing and killing and killing even little kids. Well, 
Well, the, I, the idea, the idea is that the curse of God. Yeah, they're 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 under the curse of God because and and. So you better watch out. <laughs> what is what is the biggest example we've been given for why they're under the curse of God? It's the worship of Moloch. Right, where they're sacrificing their own children in a pretty hideous way to a pagan god. Okay, they're they're going and, and killing their own children and sacrificing them. Okay. What are they doing with all the bodies, though? Of the oh, these they're burning them. They're burning everything, just leveling it to the ground, like it was never there. Wow. <laughs> That's the idea. And so it's, I mean, the, the image here, the image here, I mean, in this case, it's a conquering army doing it. Okay, or a destroying army. But the, the imagery is the same as like the flood or the fire from heaven coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? It's that, it's, it's complete, it's starting over. Like the Adam Paul. Okay, right, starting over. So the intent that God has is for this land to be cleaned out from all the evil that's going on in it, start over with Israel. We're going to see that start out with it doesn't go so well, and he's going to end up cleaning it out again, cleaning Israel out of it. Okay. This was done in the late 40s. Now, I can't remember the two villages in Palestine, but Menachem Begin, with his group, the guerrillas, yeah. went in there and slaughtered every man, woman, child, animal, everything. Yes. Right. So you're right. And after yeah. World War II, before yeah. 48. Right after World War II. Yeah. And left nothing. And nobody said a word. Dare you see. Dare you see. That's one of the villages. Yeah, I think that was there. We're not going to beg it. They are premier of Israel. This has been used. This has been used to justify <laughs> acts of violence like that. Okay. Right. Yeah. But as we've seen, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, number one, God hasn't told Israel that they're the judges of who lives and who dies. Right? Quite the opposite. Right? God has said these people are under judgment. He's using them instead of using fire or water, because in this case, He's, he's trying to give them an object lesson. If you <laughs> become wicked, this is what will happen to you. All right? So there's that. Secondly, as much as it says, everyone, 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 we just saw Rahab. We just saw Rahab. Okay. And we're going to see as we go forward, as we get into Judges and into Ruth, a lot of as we've already seen with Caleb, who's not actually an Israelite, ethnically, right? <laughs> that this isn't about ethnicity. This isn't about ethnicity here. Okay? This is about, this is about blessings and curses from God brought about by <laughs> choosing to do good or to do evil. Okay? That, that's what this is about. It's not about ethnicity. Achan was an Israelite. He was a descendant of Abraham. Okay? He got burned. Rahab, no relation to Abraham. Okay? She's part of Israel now. She's in the line that's going to give birth to, to Jesus Christ, to the Messiah. Okay? Caleb was an Amalekite. <laughs> he's considered part of the tribe of Judah now. We're gonna, he's going to come back here at Joshua. He's going to be one of Joshua's right-hand men. So this isn't ethnic. This is not ethnic purging. Okay, okay so that's, that's the end of the, the southern campaign. So chapter 11. When Jabin, king of Hatzor, Hatzor is all the way up here. Okay. Jabin, king of Hatzor, heard of this this being the southern campaign and what happened. He sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, to the kings of Shimron and Aksaf, 
These are all kings in his area up here near the Sea of Galilee. They're smaller cities. And to the northern kings who are in the mountains in the Arabah south of Kinnereth, on the western foothills and in Naphoth Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon, that's Mount Hermon, that's way up here at the top, In the region of Mizpah, they came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. Okay. So they've all now come out of their cities to attack Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them over to Israel slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. Now, that last, that sounds like a really mean thing to do to a horse. But the idea here again is they're not to try to capture the horses and chariots. Okay, Up here in the north, West South Turkey is where the Hittite Empire was. It's called the Hittite Empire. It didn't really have an emperor. It wasn't that centralized. Okay, but it was a huge region controlled by the Hittites and they had horses and chariots. They were militarily more advanced than the Canaanites here. Similar okay. to Egypt. Similar to Egypt, which also had horses and chariots. Okay. So this is a more technologically advanced enemy and God's telling them these advanced weapons they have, don't capture them, destroy them. Okay. This is again another one of those object lessons of this isn't you fighting a war. This is me fighting a war. Right? This is God fighting a war. Okay? So you don't need their advanced technology. <laughs> Just destroy it. And I'm going to make sure that you're victorious even though you're outmanned and, <laughs> and they have the superior technology. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Miram and attacked them. And the Lord that gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon, to Misrephoth, Mayim, to the valley of Mizpah in the east until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. The area that they're talking about, if you see the river that comes in up above Megiddo, okay, that's the rough area where this battle is happening. Okay. Tyre and Sidon is another Phoenician city. Are up here on the coast. So when it says they're chased back to the greater Sidon, it means they're being chased north, north back up the coast. Being beaten back. The Hittite Empire is. Right. But the kings we're talking about are between here and Hatzor. And then up, up around Mount Hermon, up at the very north part of this map. Okay. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hatzor and put its king to the sword. Hatzor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that breathed, and he burned up Hatzor itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds, except Hatzor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills. From Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal Gad, in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Except for the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites who took them all in battle. So he's saying, Joshua took all of this area, he took all of this northern area, this central area on the west side of the Jordan where the Gibeonites are, 
he didn't take because of that treaty. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them in their towns. Remember the, the Anakim, or the Anakites, the sons of Anak, were these mythical, semi-mythical giant, <laughs> giant men, sort of the, the super scary special forces of the time that the ten spies were so scared of when they came back. This is saying Joshua made it a special point, <laughs> a special point to defeat them. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. Let's see where Gath is. One of these Anakites from Gath is going to show up and become important later. <laughs> in 1 Samuel. Ashdod. These are all Philistine cities, by the way, at this point. And Gaza, which is a little further down the coast. Those are the only place where any of the Anakites survived. So Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. Okay, so now chapter 12 here is a quick summary. These are the kings of the land whom the Israelites had defeated and whose territory they took over east of the Jordan, from the Arnon Gorge to Mount Hermon, including all the eastern side of the Arabah. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, he ruled from a rower on the rim of the Arnon Gorge, from the middle of the gorge to the Jabbok River, which is the border of the Ammonites. This included half of Gilead. He also ruled over the eastern Arabah from the Sea of Kinneret to the Sea of the Arabah. The Sea of Kinneret is the Sea of Galilee. The other sea is the Dead Sea. So they're referring to this place on the east of the Jordan. You see where Gilead is labeled. Half of that down to the border with the Ammonites. to Beth Jeshemoth, and then southward below the slopes of Pisgah, and the territory of Og, king of Bashan, one of the last of the Rephaites who reigned in Ashtarot and Edre. He ruled over Mount Hermon, Selica, all of Bashan, to the border of the people of Geshur and Maka, and half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. So you can see here where Bashan is. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the Israelites conquered them, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave their land to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh to be their possession. Remember, as we read at the end of Numbers. So now these are the kings of the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered on the west side of the Jordan, from Baal, God, in the valley of Lebanon, which is just below Mount Hermon, up there at the top of the map, to Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, their lands Joshua gave as an inheritance to the tribes of Israel according to their tribal divisions. The hill country, the western foothills, the Arabah, the mountain slopes, the desert of the Negev, the lands of the Hittites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which is all the way down here to below Hebron. The king of Jericho, they now lists the kings. The king of Jericho, the king of Ai, near Bethel, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, the king of Gezer, the king of Deber, the king of Geder. Now the Septuagint doesn't have the whole list. <laughs> they sort of a summary list. But the king of Horma, the king of Arad, the king of Libna, the king of Adullam, the king of Makedah, the king of Bethel, the king of Tepua, the king of Hefer, the king of Afik, the king of Lasharon, the king of Madon, the king of Hatzor, the king of Shimron Meron, the king of Akshaf, the king of Tanik, the king of Megiddo, the king of Kedesh, the king of Jachnium in Carmel, the king of Dor in Naphath Dor, the king of Goim in Gilgal, and the king of Tirzah, 31 kings in all. Okay, so at this point, this is the halfway point of the book of Joshua, the conquest has happened, as much as it's going to happen for right now. <laughs> okay, so we've still got, you've got this issue of the Gibeonites, who haven't been conquered, who are now living among Israelites in the central region. We've still got the Philistines down here to the south. We've still got Hittites and Phoenicians up here, up here in the north. Okay. 
So next time when we get together, there'll be a new map because as we get into the next few chapters, what's going to happen is Joshua's going to start divvying up this land now amongst all the tribes into the different allotments. Now part of that is going to be the conquest isn't really done in the sense that it's going to be the job where the different tribes are assigned these different pieces of land. It's going to be their job to go in there and finish whatever's left. So whatever Canaanite cities are still there, whatever areas are still unconquered, they're supposed to go in and conquer, raise the cities like they were told. And we'll see what happens with some of the different tribes. Different tribes as we go. Since they, since they made the covenant with the Gibeonites and couldn't attack them according to the agreement. Yeah. Why is there any thought process as to why maybe they didn't allow the kings of those five cities to just wipe out the Gibeonites and therefore they wouldn't break their covenant? Well that that would have the question was, why didn't they just let the Canaanites wipe out the Gibeonites and get them out of the, the issue? Part of the covenant is mutual defense. Part of the covenants, the covenants that were made in these days, a, a crucial part of it was my enemies are your enemies, your enemies are my enemies. Okay. And that includes, that's supposed to include the covenant they made with God. So God's enemies are supposed to be their enemies. And their enemies would then be God's enemies. <laughs> but so they made a treaty with God's enemies. <laughs> Violating that. And they're choosing to honor that treaty, that covenant, over their covenant with God. Okay, and that's going, to be, that's going to be a continuous temptation that we're going to see all the way through here. Is that they're going to have these military powers around them and rather than trusting God to defend them, if these military powers attack, they're going to try and cut deals and intermarry and work out these compromises and these treaties that are going to, that are going to lead to problems. I'm still confused. Oh. Okay. It says he didn't... The only sentence it says is he didn't talk to the Lord with the Gibeonites, and then yeah. Later he's, when he find, and he thinks they're from far away. He doesn't think they're from the country that the Lord told him he had to destroy everybody. Right. So then when they go, and three days later, they see a way <laughs> this land. Then he says, well, we can't kill you now because we took an oath with, like, by the Lord. Who is the Lord of the Israelites? So, right. I, and then they kept winning. So I think they, <laughs> they were okay. I mean, I think because God didn't come and say, well, He didn't speak with the Lord, but the Lord didn't come and say to them, "You don't believe them. They're really from next door. They aren't from far away." So right, because they don't but but life. they're there to inquire of the Lord. Right. Joshua is taking the initiative. And the, the areas where we see the disapproval are number one, that talking about how when when the Gibeonites are attacked and they come to their defense, it's God, not the Israelites, who wipes out the attackers with the hail. Right? God intervenes directly, which is a tip off, right? If he's having to intervene rather than having Israel kill them, that he and Israel are not on the same page anymore. Right? That he's doing it directly. Really and, and, and secondly, remember that episode comes right after Joshua just reread them in the book of Deuteronomy, which tells them, do not make treaties with these people, number one. And number two, tells them how to get out of an oath. <laughs> they make an oath. <laughs> they, there's a problem how to repent of that oath. Did, did None they, of which they did. Do the Hivites come back later? And yes. <laughs> yes. Foreshadowing. They, yeah, they, they remain Canaanites, and we're gonna, we're gonna see that as we go forward. So, 
instead of using, instead of God destroying them like through hailstorms and fire, or natural things, right. he's using the Israelites to do their job as an object lesson. To, to teach the Israelites, yes. Yeah. To communicate to the Israelites. And so we now understand, we now understand this in a more spiritual sense, right? Because we understand that the, the true enemies of God, right, aren't the people who have fallen into sin, right? It's, it's the sin they've fallen into and the demonic beings who have led them into that, who have led them into that sin. Okay, so we now understand it in that more spiritual sense. This is a more direct, we're dealing with Bronze Age people, right? This is a more direct, when you do these wicked things, this is the destruction that you bring upon yourself. So, and we're going to, and we're going to see, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be exactly invading armies, when Israel goes down the same path and starts behaving like the Canaanites, and when their iniquity gets full, it's going to be invading armies who come in. Okay, and those invading armies are going to be pagans. I mean, they're going to be heathens, <laughs> right? So it's not God justifying those heathens killing people. They're just being used as a as a means. questions? Okay, well next week, like I said new map, we'll be looking at the different tribes and where they end up living and uh, where they're at going forward and then we, we may we may actually finish Joshua next week um, we'll see we may end up finishing Joshua next week in which case in two weeks we'll be starting Judges which has lots of excitement and horror and <laughs> so thank you everybody.